All right, welcome back to Anton Math. Now, in this video, I'm going to go over a couple of um, a couple of principles: uh, absolute value, floor, and definition. I'm going to define those. So, the first one is absolute value. I want to go over what absolute value is and what exactly what we mean by that. Absolute value. Now, if I have some real number x, right? We denote the absolute value by this notation here. This means absolute value of x and we define that by the absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to 0 and the absolute value of x is equal to negative x if x is less than 0, right? So if x is negative 2 the absolute value is negative negative 2 or in other words positive 2, right? So in other words uh, it's going to be the total distance from 0 on a number line, right? Total distance from zero, right? We can always think of the absolute value as being the total positive distance from zero. I don't really need to say positive, right? When we talk about distance, we know distance needs to be a positive number. So we're total distance from zero, okay? Now I'm going to do a little aside here. Um, we talked earlier about the complex numbers, and here I, you know, you notice that I said for x in the real numbers we define the absolute value in this way. Now for x in the complex numbers it's a little bit different and I still have this little uh, page we had before uh, where we kind of talked about these complex numbers. Now uh, the absolute value of a complex number we call the modulus. Now I'm going to denote it the same way but this is called the modulus of the complex number z. And it can be, think it can be thought of as the total distance from the origin. Right? So we're kind of expanding. We had absolute value in real numbers is the total distance from zero on the number line. Now in complex numbers we know we don't have a number line. We have a number plane called the complex plane. So the absolute value of a number z, if I have this point z up here on the plane, we know that a is my real value, b is my imaginary. This modulus is going to be the total distance from the origin, or in other words, this total distance from z in my plane to this point 0, 0, right? So this line that I just drew in here, this is my modulus, right? And I'll go ahead and denote that here. This is my modulus, oops, modulus of z. Okay, now we know just from basic trigonometry, I know that if I have this right triangle, and that's exactly what I have here, right? I have this right angle here. I have this property, if this is my c, I know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now we usually don't denote this as c, um, we denote it as r, right? This is, we actually call r or the modulus of z. But it's very easy to see, I can just take the square root of both sides, and we get that the modulus of z is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Notice that I don't have any i's in here. i kind of goes away because of the way this triangle works. I'm looking at the total distance, right? I'm not looking at the distance in reals and in imaginaries. I'm looking at the total distance, or the shortest distance, and we know that that's just going to be a straight line from the point to my origin. So before I go back to real numbers, uh, let's do a quick example here. Um, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll do an example at the end. Let's go ahead and go back to real numbers and talk about my floor and my ceiling. Okay, so my floor, we denote this, if I'm talking about x, the floor of x, it, you know, it kind of looks like a floor, doesn't it? I have these two kind of half brackets on either side, and I, I kind of fill them in from the left and the right underneath x. It's the floor of x. And the way that I define this, I'm actually going to define it in set notation because you know we're learning set notation. And this set that I'm writing, it only has one value in it. It'll be pretty easy to see that. So the floor of x is defined to be the number n, where n is an integer. And I have one more restriction, and that's going to be where n is less than or equal to x and x is strictly less than n plus 1. So we know if n is an integer, then n plus 1 is going to be the next integer, right? the next integer up. So we see the floor of a number is the largest integer less 
than the number itself. So the floor of x is the largest integer less than or equal to x. Now if x is an integer, then the floor of x is just going to be x, right? That's pretty easy to see. And then we have a very similar concept called ceiling. And we denote this, you know, kind of like the floor, but now, you know, there's this roof above x coming from either side. This is the ceiling of x. And the way that we define the ceiling of x, this is going to be the smallest integer that is greater than or equal to x, right? So in set notation, I can write that as the number n, where n is an integer, and n minus 1 is strictly less than x, but x is less than or equal to n, right? So again, if x is an integer, then it's going to be its own ceiling. And that's the only time when the ceiling and the floor of a number equal each other is when x itself is an integer. But in, um, otherwise, the floor is just the integer below x, and the ceiling is just the integer above x. Okay, so let's do some uh, quick examples. And we can probably just go ahead and do them on here. I don't think I need a fresh page for these. Some examples. So, you know, pretty, the absolute value is pretty easy. You know, the absolute value of a positive number, by definition, is just the number itself, right? So if x is greater than or equal to 0, it's just a number. So the absolute value of 5.3 is just equal to 5.3. And the absolute value of negative 17 is equal to, well, negative 17 is less than 0. So it's going to be negative negative 17, or in other words, positive 17. Now I know you've all seen absolute value before, so this should be uh, pretty familiar. So let's do some floor and ceilings. If I have the ceiling of 5.3, well, that's going to be the integer above 5.3, right? So that's going to be equal to 6. If I have the floor of 7.4, that's the integer below 7.4. So that's going to be 7. Pretty easy stuff, right? Now, floor and ceiling get a little bit tricky when we get uh, into negative numbers. So let's take a look at that. If I have the floor of negative 18.3, well, floor is defined to be the integer that's less than or equal to negative 18.3. Now remember, with negative numbers, that means I'm going more negative, right? If it's less than 18.3, that means I'm going to the left on a number line, or in other words, the floor is going to be negative 19, okay? Now, the ceiling, I'm doing exactly the opposite. If I have a ceiling of a negative number, for example, the ceiling of negative 3.2, that means that it's the next integer that's um, that's increased from negative 3.2. In other words, I'm going to the right on the number line or I'm getting less negative, right? I'm going in the positive direction here. So that's just going to be negative 3, isn't it? So we see kind of an opposite thing going on. With positive integers, the floor is just the integer part, whereas with negative integers, the ceiling is the integer part. And then we need to add 1 to the integer part for the, other, for the others. Okay. Now, before I end this video and this section, I'm um, just going to I'm just going to do one quick example of modulus with a complex number. So let's say I'm looking at the modulus of 3 plus 4i, right? Now we derived on the other page, this is going to be equal to the square root of a squared, now here my a is 3, plus b squared, and here my b is 4. So in other words, that's the square root, 3 squared is 9, plus 4 squared is 16. In other words, the square root of 16 plus 9 is 25. And we define the square root of a number to be the positive root, right? That's going to be 5. So the modulus of 3 plus 4i is 5. Now something I'd like to note, the modulus of 3 plus 4i is 5. That's going to be up here over in quadrant 1, right? So that's my a is um, 3, my b is 4. But note that the modulus of 3 minus 4i, or the modulus of minus 3 plus 4i, or the modulus of minus 3 minus 4i, right? These are all the same, and they're all equal to 5. Why? Well, if I look at 3 minus 4i, that's positive 3 in my real. Actually, let's look at a different one, so I'm not writing over myself. But look at minus 3 minus 4i. That means I'm going minus 3 in the real direction, right? So I'm still doing a total distance of 3 here. I'm doing minus 4 
in the imaginary direction, so that's still a total distance of 4. So when I look at that triangle here, right, I'm still looking at the same hypotenuse on this triangle, the same total distance from my point. Um, this is the point minus 3 minus 4i, right? So for those of you who remember this from pre-calculus, uh, the modulus of a number, you can kind of switch out these negatives and positives. They don't really matter um, because we're squaring everything. All right. I hope this video was helpful. Uh, this ends this first section of discrete math, and we'll see you in the next one.